104.1 FM streaming live from the Deep Green Festival and Conference at the Craneway Pavilion in Richmond, California. I'm Sabrina Jacobs, uh, correspondent with KPFA, and today I am sitting with Dr. Larry, and that's Dr. Larry what? Bedard. Okay, Bedard. Oh, it's okay. hard to remember. Yeah. Okay, it's very French. <laughs> yeah, French Canadian. <laughs> Dr. Larry Bedard and Patrick Goggins. Goggins. Goggin without the S. Goggin without the S. So we've got, and you're a lawyer, is that correct? That is correct. Okay, so we've got a lawyer and a doctor here. We'll be covering several aspects, several main aspects or categories of the cannabis movement, which would be the legal side and, of course, the medicinal health side. Okay, so Dr. Larry Bedard, what do you, what exactly do you do in your practice? What type of uh, practicing physician are you? Well, I'm a board-certified emergency physician. I spent my entire career practicing emergency medicine. Uh, For health reasons, I retired from the clinical practice in 2005. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I've been involved in medical politics for 30 years, so... I'm very involved with the California Medical Association and the American College of Emergency Physicians and trying to advance the agenda of legalization uh, with activities through those professional societies. Okay. Now let me ask you this. Um, in your career as a physician, was there a time when you were not a part of the cannabis movement? Um, was there a turning point for you that made you become a part of the cannabis movement? Well, I like to say I got involved very early but got committed in 2009. Uh, In 1972, President Richard Nixon coerced me into joining the Navy. Uh, At that time, during Vietnam, they were drafting physicians every other year. Mm -hmm. My year came up, and my choices were either to go to Vietnam as a general medical officer or to enlist as a psychiatrist and train as a psychiatrist. I chose that option after three months. uh, I don't want to offend any psychiatrists, but it was like watching grass grow. End result is, even with only one year of training, the Navy made me a psychiatrist at the Navy Drug Rehab Center. I mean, this was shortly after the Controlled Substance Act was passed. Uh, I realized at that time that a lot of uh, my patients, Marines, sailors, were using marijuana for medicinal reasons. We didn't have a name at that time, post-traumatic stress disorder, but I'm sure a lot of them were self-medicating for that. Uh, I involved, uh, started moonlighting, became an emergency physician, and practiced in Wren County for 21 years. And I guess my experience as an emergency physician with problems with marijuana was virtually non-existent. In a 20-some year career, I saw less than 10 patients who presented because of a problem with marijuana. Uh, None of them needed to be admitted. Uh, And the most common presentation was either mom and dad who had been convinced by their teenager to be cool because, you know, Jimmy's mother smoked. Mm -hmm. And then about five minutes after they're smoking, they end up starting getting tightness in their chest and a short of breath and numb and they're basically having an anxiety reaction. Mm. So that's my experience as an emergency physician. In 2009, because of my involvement in medical politics, I introduced a resolution asking the California Medical Association to support the legalization of both adult usage and medicinal marijuana. It took, about, it took us about two years, but last October, A California Medical Association representing 35,000 physicians became the first medical society in the country to support and endorse legalization for adult usage in the distant marijuana. So you were part of drafting this resolution, right? I drafted it. I was the author. Mm -hmm. They then set up a marijuana task force, sat on that, Mm -hmm. and the task force made a recommendation to the Board of Trustees, and they adopted our recommendations unanimously. Okay. All right. Patrick Goggins, attorney at law. What type of law do you practice? Well, as far as the cannabis world is uh, concerned, I've been advocating for the re-legalization of industrial hemp farming going back to actually my days at UC Santa Barbara in the late 80s. I got my law degree in 1996 and decided 
I, I went into law for environmental reasons and went into a general practice with my father down in Southern California and decided that I was going to focus my environmental advocacy, which I thought I had learned uh, as a history student in Santa Barbara. The, 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 well, I read Jack Herrer's uh, The Emperor Wears No Clothes and, and learned, you know, was educated on, on the history of the prohibition of cannabis, which entangled hemp and the benefits of hemp in, in, in environmentally and in, industrially. And, and so I've been advocating from that realm uh, for now going on about 16, 17 years. I've helped shepherd a bill through the legislature uh, back in 06 and 07, and then last year, uh, which would have legalized uh, hemp farming in the state of California, set up a, a, law cha a legal challenge in court with federal government, basically a state's rights argument. And unfortunately, we thought that we had Arnold veto it twice in, in, in 06 and 07, and we thought mm -hmm. we had it last year with, with Governor Brown, but uh, to no avail, he actually vetoed it. And then in 2005, I, I, I got involved in, in San Francisco. My law practice is in San Francisco. I, I have a wide um, general practice. I'm, uh, I've got my own law office there in the flood building and mm -hmm. the Powell stop. And, and I got involved in uh, the, the establishment of regulations for dispensaries in the city. And, and since then, got involved in other jurisdictions around Northern California and, and helping to craft and shape reasonable regulations that weren't so industry-sided and law enforcement-sided. They were somewhere in the middle and had a good, good run on that. And then in the same week last mm -hmm. week that, that the crackdown, federal crackdown occurred, Jerry Brown uh, vetoed the hemp bill. So really now I'm an anti-prohibitionist and, and looking to uh, end the insanity of the 75-year prohibition. Why do you think it keeps getting vetoed? I mean, why do you think the various governors that we've had, the last two governors that we've had, have vetoed the possibility of making any type or any form of cannabis legal? Well, What are th they afraid of? Well, they've got different reasons. I mean, Sch Schwarzenegger, he was deeply embedded with narcotics officers and various law enforcement folks. Governor Brown, while not, he didn't buy, he doesn't buy the law enforcement arguments. Um, he stood behind the fear that California farmers would be vulnerable to federal prosecution. And even though we presented him with our legal strategy that would you needed to get the seed. We would head into court, seek declaratory relief, get a court to d make a decision on whether or not we could proceed under this regime. He, at the end of the day, I, I believe what from what I what I understand is he just didn't believe that this was something that was going to really help bring jobs and and and, and resources to our economy. He didn't buy that argument. He's wrong, but he didn't buy it. He's completely I'm, wrong. I mean, I think, and I've been involved in politics for a long time. I think it was a political decision that Jerry Brown was afraid that he'd look soft on crime and the Republicans would use that uh, to campaign against him or to oppose legislation. I think the same thing is happening with President Obama and Eric Holder. In, in fact, I think they're swinging, their pendulum has swung way too far uh, to the right because I think they uh, particularly Obama can't be perceived as showing some concern or favoritism to the Afro-American community. So I think he's overreacted uh, by allowing the crackdown to continue. What some folks are saying, and I, I'm leaning more towards this belief as well, is that the, um, uh, is it the Department of Justice or is it the... Um, In the state or federal? Uh, federal. Department of Justice. Okay, so Department of Justice kind of took it upon themselves to go ahead with this Oaksterdam raid. Um, without Obama's knowledge or, or well, went over his head or went around him to, to make this happen. This, I mean, a this lot of folks have been feeling that way. I kind of feel that way as th well. This goes back to, so you have to look at the evolution within the Obama administration of the policy. I mean, because of what he said, I mean, in 2008 after he was elected or whatever. You know? Well, what happened in, in, in November of 2009, uh, a memo was issued. It was the Ogden memo. And that came out of essentially Eric Holder's office. And 
it said that we don't want U.S. attorneys using limited, valuable resources on enforcing federal laws against folks that are abiding by state law. It was a yellow light. It was not mm -hmm. a green light. It right. was perceived as a green light by many. It, it was right after the recession had hit, mm -hmm. and there was a gold rush. And you had everybody and their mother jumping into the game, mm -hmm. and there ensued the backlash. And it was it was on the ground. It was real in in local jurisdictions. With you know hysteria was being you know shouted out by the moms and 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 in the name of the youth. And but mostly law enforcement exploited this. I believe firmly that that what is behind this and behind killing the industrial hemp bill and and legalizing, re-legalizing industrial hemp farming in this country again is about budget and job retention. And ultimately, fast forward to the summer of 2011, you have the coal memo, and it was another, like, it was an orange light. It was almost red, but it was, it, there was a little bit of opening, and, and, and that came as a result of pressure, I believe, <laughs> from federal law enforcement and state law enforcement here in California um, saying, you know, to go into the U.S. Attorney saying, we need you to do something, we need you to act, we need support in this, and Obama and Holder did not have the political capital to stand up to that. They, you know, each engaged in their own political, um, yeah. it, you know, situation, and they weren't going to expend whatever they had left on defending this or moving th the policy forward and therefore it opened up the crackdown. Yeah. I mean I can't possibly imagine that Obama doesn't know what's occurring. And it started in October kind of at the height of the Republican primaries where you had seven potential candidates beating up on Obama so he had uh, I believe looked tough on crime. What they did to Richard Lee I think is abominable <laughs> uh, almost should violates the American with Disability Act, uh, but he knows what's happening. Uh, I'm sure, and, and again, I believe it's for political reasons. He's, you know, waving his finger in the air and realizes the Republicans would go after him as soft on crime. Hmm. I think it's the head of DEA. I think it's M Michelle Lionheart is is calling the shots. And on, they're not getting, they're not standing in the way. Well, he, he, he's he, the president of the United States. He appoints her. I, I, I mean, let, let's look at the issue of rescheduling from Schedule One. The science has been in for over a decade that marijuana has unique medicinal properties. Obama's an intelligent man. Policy ought to be based on science and not politics. Yet, after a nine year petition by normal, the DEA in June of last year denied uh, to even discuss re uh, scheduling in a meaningful way. It's part of the political process. Undoubtedly, I think he's. I think he's afraid. I think he might be different three years from now if he were reelected. But hmm. I'm one of the few. Okay. So one hopeful, one not. <laughs> a little bit of hope. It's a tiny bit. Okay. So. I wanted to talk about, switch gears a little bit here, and Dr. Larry, I wanted to talk about, uh, as far as with your psychiatric practice, um, with some of the patients that you've seen over the last 30 years, have you seen a difference in um, people being more openly accepting of marijuana? Um, uh, I mean, absolutely. Have you been able to change minds as a psychiatrist? Well, first of all, I'm not a uh, I, my only psychiatric experience was when you were in the Navy. Uh, the two years I was in the Navy, okay. which was good training because okay. not only did I learn about marijuana, I learned about heroin and alcohol. Okay. And uh, as most emergency physicians, you become an expert in the acute adverse reaction to, mm -hmm. to drug problems. So I feel I have a lot of expertise, but you virtually never saw a, a significant problem with marijuana. In, in fact, the last year the data is available, in 2008, there were 181 admissions in the 400 and some hospitals in California. So that's like one for every five hospitals. At the same time, there were 34,000 admissions for alcohol-related problems. 
DT seizures, you know, hallucinations. Uh, I mean, you ask any emergency physician, it's 50 times alcohol is 50 times the, uh, the problems you see with, with, with uh, marijuana. Okay. And let's see here. Anything else either one of you want to add? Um, do you have any events coming up um, or any type of um, speaking engagements or anything like that? Well, the California Medical Association took a, a, a task force and basically made it into a standing committee on marijuana. I'm optimistic that the California Medical Association will sponsor one, and hopefully, and I'm going to do everything I can, two initiatives in 2014. I think they will uh, sponsor an initiative uh, because I think it's necessary for patient protection to regulate medicinal marijuana and hopefully, and their policy says they support legalization of adult usage, and I believe they will sponsor one or possibly both of these initiatives in 2014. I just want to give a, a couple of plugs. I've been involved with the Deep Green folks and helping to um, get last year's conference and this, confer this year's conference um, going and helping with the programming, and, and I, I just want to say this, this effort is, in, in, in all my years, it's, it's been, it, 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 it represents kind of the glue that's bringing diff these different factions. There's a lot of factions within the cannabis movement from the industrial side, the medical side, the recreational side, and what have you. And, and we've seen over the last few years is, is, is kind of the, the, the divisiveness that occurs within the movement. And th th right here, Deep Green is about bringing everybody together, saying, you know, all opinions, all judgments are welcome under one roof and, and we need to work together right now is, is the time for unity in this movement if we're going to end prohibition in the next 10 years we all got to stick together and one last plug for uh, I'm on the board of directors of Vote Hemp and it's the um, education uh, kind of lobbying arm of the industrial hemp movement votehemp.com please support us take action out there the the HIA.org is a great uh, trade association for the for the industrial hemp um, uh, industry. Right now, we're we're it's been a tough go the last few decades. We thought we'd be there by now. We have to import all these raw materials. Please reach out to your uh, representatives in D.C. and in, in, in support of repealing, at the very least, repealing the silly prohibition of, of doing our farmers growing a crop that every other farmer in the you know, industrialized nations can do, particularly in Canada. The biggest consumer market is right here in the United States. We're driving it. If we could farm industrial hemp, we would be able to uh, broaden this, what we see as a, a multi future multi-billion dollar year industry into something much larger than what it is. We need it. Thank All you. All right. And that's Patrick Goggin and Dr. Larry Bedard. Thank you. Okay. Do you have any well, last the, well, words? Uh, well, yeah. One last word is mm -hmm. one. I practiced my entire career as an emergency physician, so I'm not a primary care provider, and I personally have never written a recommendation uh, for medicinal marijuana. I approach this, I think, from a civil rights issue and a patient's rights issue. Uh, I gave a talk to the American Society of Bioethicists, looked into the American Medical Association's Code of Ethics. Their Code of Ethics 1.02 says, if a physician believes the law is unjust, they should work to change it. Prohibition is clearly unjust, uh, particularly since we've been talking about President Obama, disproportionate arrest of people of color, Afro-Americans, Latino. It's an unjust law, and I as a physician believe I have a responsibility to try and change it. Alrighty, thank you so much, Dr. Larry Bedard and Patrick Goggin. We appreciate you stopping by and talking to us here on the Ustream, the Pacific Radio, KPFA 94.1 FM, kpfa.org. I'm Sabrina Jacobs here at the Deep Green Festival and Conference, second annual Earth Day celebration. It's Saturday. There's still some tickets available, so if you want to come on by and check it out, they got some amazing boots and some amazing speakers. Panels are still happening. And yeah, we'll be going on until about 12 o'clock. We've got some music that's going to be happening this evening as well. Check out the website, deepgreenfest.com. That's deepgreenfest.com. Oh.
know this ambient noise doesn't get picked up. No. This, this just takes it out. It's like a filter. Keep Going it. ham for weed. Keep it coming up. No. Two, one, two. You could call it waking bacon. Vocal. Hey, hey. Two. <laughs> right? Okay. That's, that's Marijuana infused bacon. Call it waking bacon. No. Okay. I try. 